My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, the creator of the term FOMO, and I'm coming at you from AW360 Studios in the global capital of FOMO, New York City. Lately, the word FOBO, short for fear of a better option, has been getting some press. Twice, the Smarter Living column in the New York Times talked about FOBO and how paralyzing it can be to choose from various options and opportunities and settle on just one thing. In fact, I've always believed that in many ways, FOBO is far more difficult to manage than FOMO because we live in a world where the amount of options available to us is only expanding. Unfortunately, few of us ever stop to think about what's really driving our decisions. Are we relying on facts or are we driven by emotions? What kind of biases are clouding our judgment? Most importantly, is there a way to fight FOBO? My guest today has a compelling solution that might just make your life a whole lot easier. Cheryl Strauss-Einhorn is the creator of the AREA Method, a decision-making system for individuals and companies to solve complex problems. Cheryl is the founder of CSC Consulting and the author of the book, Problem Solved, a powerful system for making complex decisions with confidence and conviction. Cheryl teaches as an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School and has won several journalism awards for her investigative stories about international politics, business, and economics. So that's an amazing Amazing background. Welcome to the show, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I like to start the same question every time. And the question I have for you to start is, what is giving you FOMO right now? What is giving me FOMO right now? Um, I guess it's thinking about really how to allocate my time well. Okay. You know, when I think about all the different things that I want to do in a given day, am I allocating it well? Am I using the time in a way that is going to work with my circadian rhythm? Is it a way that is also going to make it possible to actually get the different things done that I want to get done in a day? And how's that going for you? I think I'm doing a little bit better on it. I've always been a fan of lists and time coding my day and thinking about when my energy level is better for concentrating as opposed to more routine tasks. And I've really tried to put aside email and you just only put it into certain parts of the day, which means sometimes now I don't get back to people the same day, but I'm actually getting more work done. It's interesting that you say that about email because I've had, I have two minds about that. Some people have told me um, the most successful people out there are also the most responsive. So a friend was telling me that they um, they wrote an email to Reed Hoffman and he was back to them in like 30 seconds, right? So I'm, I mean, Reed Hoffman, good, good job. But at the same time, deep work uh, requires you to step away from those kinds of distractions. So I have kind of tried to do what you're doing, which is to say, okay, I'm going to put away the email for now. I'm going to close the laptop. I turned off all notifications on my phone. I've really endeavored to do this. No phone in the bedroom, all these sorts of things. But it is, um, you're right, It's it, for, the, for us FOMO sapiens, it's an ongoing struggle. I think not only is it an ongoing struggle, but willpower is a very interesting phenomena. On the days where I can be most rigorous and adhere to the template that I've set out for myself, oftentimes then you need sort of a rebound day where you just relax the rules. So I've found for me it's very comfortable that it doesn't have to be a very consistent all or nothing. There can be certain days where I check it first thing in the morning, I'm going to check it again at lunch, I'm going to check it towards the tail end of the day, and then I can give myself a day where I'm just going to be in and out of it more. Makes sense. So you are a journalist. You've, you can tell us all about your career in journalism, but you've drawn on that to also become an expert in making decisions, fact-based rational decisions. So take us through your journey from journalist to decision-making guru. 
So I'd love to. So my background is as an investigative journalist, as you mentioned. I spent a decade at the business magazine, Barron's. And Barron's is one of those magazines where you write about publicly traded companies and you make recommendations to the readers about what you think may happen with the share price performance. And I sort of ended up specializing in what you might call the bearish company story. Those are stories that take a skeptical look at a company's finances or at their strategy. And when those stories would come out, there'd often be a large share price reaction. Sometimes an exchange might halt the shares. Sometimes wow. regulators would get involved. One time, a CEO went to jail for 10 years. A couple of the companies went out of business. And these stories really, they weighed heavily on me. You know, it's not just somebody's money in their investment portfolio. It's somebody's retirement account. Or if you happen to work at one of those companies, you could be impacted. Or if you happen to be a customer of the products and services that those companies sold. And so I just started to think about how do I know that I'm really making good decisions? How do I know that I'm looking at information and coming to a sound conclusion? And at the time, there was the beginning of all this research that now is becoming much more aware for all of us about how we're all flawed thinkers. Mm. And we have these heuristics, these biases that we rely upon. And as a middle middle class kid from outside of Boston, I just started to think about, you know, I think it's hubris to say that I could look at a data set and just say, I'm going to be objective now. And so I thought, given my background in research, what if I invert that idea? What if instead I say, I'm going to go all in on the idea that I'm a flawed thinker, and I'm going to see if I can set up a construct, a research process, that can actually help me control for and counteract some of these biases, think about the incentives and motives of my sources or the other stakeholders involved in my decision, and see if there's a way to really expand my knowledge while improving my judgment. So this came out of your work as a journalist. I guess when you're a journalist and you're starting out, you get out of college, you sort of like, you're on your first story. How do you actually learn how to even sort of think about conducting the research you need to tell a story in a fact sort of centric way? So um, I'd spent four years during college to help pay for college working at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and I ended up running their consumer complaint department. Mm -hmm. They have... Um, a lot of laws that they protect in terms of um, truth in advertising and fair credit reporting um, and also some things related to mergers and acquisitions. And so people would call me with their information and then, then I would have to go and do research on some of these companies to see whether or not we wanted to make recommendations to the staff attorneys to possibly bring cases. And so I started to really organize my thinking about um, when you're looking at a company, how is it that you really take apart the information? And then I ended up going to graduate school at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia. And I came right out into um, a news-breaking magazine about Wall Street where you write five stories a week and a cover story every four weeks. And it's really an opportunity to write a lot and I think and research a lot. And I think when you're becoming an investigative journalist, the more that you have to do, the more comfortable you get that you have to make the phone calls, you have to vet all the information because the stories are gonna be coming out quickly. And so I think it really gives you an opportunity to continually practice. And I think it's really this intentional practice that gets us to higher levels of learning and performance. Got it, and so you say in, your, in, in the book, as you talk about the area method, one of the, kind of the, the setup to the whole process is that you, a good process and good information equals Good decisions, great decisions. I, I would, I, I think, is the term. How for somebody who hasn't been a journalist and you know hasn't gone through that kind of rigor in terms of building the skill, how do you get? How do you sort of build the muscles to find? good information. So I'm so glad that you asked that because one of the updates to the research and pedagogy in my system called the area method is that research is fundamental to decision making and yet there are no books out there that guide you on a research process where you're going to make a decision at the end of it. The other decision making systems out there generally say explore your options mm -hmm. where you could have FOBO or FOMO <laughs> um, as a single step and so they lump research as one step when 
when really research is an umbrella term for a whole series of tricky steps that need to be thoughtfully and carefully navigated. So one of the things that my system does is that it breaks down research so it's not a black box and it gives you a series of steps that follow a logical progression so that your hand is held all the way through guiding you where to look for information and also so what once you've got it what do you want to do with it what are the kind of questions that you want to ask of the data and what's the kind of analysis that you want to do okay that's interesting yeah because i do agree with you as somebody who read, you know, uh, read and written a book, I, 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 I think a lot of times we just assume that it's, you say, okay, go ahead and figure out this company or this industry. And then we assume that people sort of know how to do these things. But you were right. As I read your book, one thing that I hadn't thought about explicitly is you talk about going and seeing the world through somebody else's perspective, right? And that is something that you know, as egocentric human beings, we may just assume that we know what other people's perspective looks like or really what even those, who those other people are. And so in the, what I've noticed about your approach is that there's a big sort of focus on that piece. That's a kind of a, a really different shift is thinking about, okay, who are the other people involved here or the other institutions, the other, I guess, factors involved and thinking from their perspective. So that's exactly right. So the AREA method, and AREA is an acronym for the steps of my process, which is absolute information from close up on the target of mm -hmm. your decision. The next concentric circle is R relative. Those are sources that are somehow connected, secondary or tertiary sources. Area E is both exploration and exploitation. Exploration gets you beyond document-based sources to teach you about interviewing and identifying good people to talk to and asking them great questions. The second E, exploitation, is about turning your lens inward on yourself as a decision maker to really test your assumptions against evidence with a series of exercises that I've learned from other disciplines like journalism, medicine, or the intelligence gathering community. And then the final A analysis cobbles all of your information back together and it helps you come to conviction. So at the very heart of the area method is this beautiful idea of perspective taking as you mentioned it. Because the way that we understand the world and the way that we understand our facts might be entirely different than somebody else looking at the exact same set of data. So what perspective taking does is it gives you a two for one. By pushing you out of your perspective and walking in somebody else's footsteps, you can better suss out their incentives and motives. You also gain distance on yourself and that allows you to have this opportunity to bubble up those assumptions and judgments that often are underpinning our questions or the way that we're understanding our information. So it's really, I love this. It's like, I, as somebody, <laughs> I mean, I think all of us struggle with making decisions, especially I think back to those, you know, those big decisions in life. It's like, should I quit my job? And you do some of those things. I remember I talked to lots of people or I would sit there and make lists and, you know, pros and cons and things, but it wasn't structured. I didn't have a process to follow. And what you're laying out for us here with the area method is really a step-by-step -step process for tackling those decisions in life where you know you really owe it to yourself to invest the time and energy to do things properly. Well, that's exactly right. When you're solving for an important but uncertain future, your own, you need time for thoughtful reflection. So another thing that the system does is it builds in strategic stops all along the way. And I call those stops cheetah pauses. So why the cheetah? Well, the cheetah's prodigious hunting skill is not its ability to accelerate like a race car. It's actually that it can decelerate by up to nine miles an hour in a single stride. And in hunting, that's far more important because if you can decelerate that quickly, you've got something that's agile and maneuverable and flexible. And those are all the things that you need in a good decision-making system. So wherever I suggest a strategic stop, I have what I call a cheetah sheet. Think of them like the graphic organizers of the area method. And that's where you can find these handy tips of where to look for information, or what questions to ask of it, and how to analyze what you've collected. So again, your hand is held the whole way through because we all grow up to be decision makers and yet somehow there's never been any system for us to all learn in our homes or in schools to solve complex problems. It's interesting, uh, when I read this part about the cheetah, I didn't know this about cheetahs. Uh, I really liked it, I thought it was really cool because you know, I thought, First of all, I was like, is it cheat, cheat, cheetah, sheet? That's clever. But then these cheetah pauses, I, whenever I get overwhelmed with information, which happens not too often, but it does happen, I take a nap 
It's like I, it's weird. It's like I have a, you know, down. there's these animals that like when they like, when they're under threat they just pass out or something or they fake die. When I get overwhelmed, I go straight to a bed and sleep for about three hours. And then when I wake up, I have the sort of I don't know if it's emotional distance or the calm of mind or whatever, but I have the ability to then take this situa- situation on in a, in a much different way, and I'm able to process the information in a much more effective way, and maybe sort of start beginning to draw some initial conclusions. So I guess what I didn't realize is that I'm doing sort of a cheetah pause myself. Absolutely, and I think researchers tell us obvious, and and there have been studies on this recently that if you learn um, information and then you take a nap, often those people have tended to have better recall and retention of the material. So I think you would fit right into (laughs) what the recent research tends to show on that. But I find that in today's modern technology world, we're answering emails late at night or responding to texts. It's very rare that we're doing one thing at a time. And so building strategic stops into the process, I think, Um, is something that is very welcome from the vantage point that we don't have to be in a rush and we do need to chunk our learning and make our work work for us. So these are actually sort of pauses that refresh, like the cheetah who's slowing down so she can figure out did lunch move left or did lunch move right we get an opportunity to basically say, so what, what do I have now? What are the implications of it? And that speaks to another vantage point of the area method, which is that it's also a feedback loop, right? Not all investigations are linear, nor should they be. So at times you need to be driven back into part or all of the process to gain new information or new insight. So I I love this. I mean, for those of us who maybe are gut decision makers, and then to hear a system that you could use to verify what you're thinking your gut tells you, or to maybe you don't have the gut. It's sort of like, it's it's comforting to know that you, you develop a system to do that. Can you take us through kind of an example of how somebody would apply this in the real life? You have some great examples in your book that are both business and personal, but what's a favorite for you of somebody who's used the area method to actually make an important decision in their life? So one of my favorites is the story of Micah. He's actually one of the stories that I chronicle in the book. And um, Micah is a high school senior. He has two great options for college, and he thinks that he wants to be a doctor. He's been accepted at Johns Hopkins, and and he's been accepted at Pitt. Yep. And, you know, looking at these two options right off the top, Hopkins has quite a reputation in medicine. Um, and he's a very fortunate person. He's the only son of two working parents. And whereas for many of us, the overwhelming factor would be that Pitt had offered him some money and Hopkins didn't. In this instance, he didn't have to do it on a purely financial basis. But his parents sat him down and said, this is a major decision that will have consequences for you for many years after you've completed it. Let's try the area method. So in the absolute phase where you begin close up on the target, where you let the target speak in its own words, he went right to the websites for both Hopkins and Pitt. And on Hopkins' website, it tells of its august history and all the Nobel Prize winners. And it's clear that if you go to Hopkins, you're going to be part of that illustrious history, and that's part of what you're getting. And on the Pitt website, when he went on it, he immediately was able to see something that was far more student-centric. It featured the student-to-teacher ratio. It featured the different kinds of clubs that the school had. And it really seemed to be reaching outward that you were going to be joining something that was very active as opposed to buying a reputation. Now, this is just what he found at a moment in time, your own investigation and websites change frequently and search engines guide you for how you're going to end up on a landing page, may give you entirely different information. But then he went into the relative phase, and there, those are sources that are somehow connected. He did a literature review, what do um, what do news articles say about how the two schools treat the pre-med majors? He went on to college confidential. What do other students have to say about the student experience at both schools? He went on to rate my professor. 
do full professors teach courses at both of the schools? And he found that at this particular moment in time that the ratings for some of the pre-med courses at Hopkins did not tend to have full professors or had professors who weren't that accessible, whereas the students at Pitt rated their professors in the pre-med courses higher on a more routine basis. Wow. And he also went to U.S. News and World Report to look at not only how did the schools rank, but how did their medical schools rank? And there he found something that, again, as he's looking at vetting and trying to match up the story from the perspective of the targets themselves versus what outsiders have to say, he found out that Pitt had a hospital and a medical school rated number one in its area. And this started to change his thinking. He knew Hopkins was number one in its area. In exploration, when he got beyond document-based sources, he was able to speak to current students How easy is it to do undergraduate research at the two schools? And he was able to contact the pre-med advising offices. And in that moment, what he found out from just phone calls in those two different groups was that the pre-med advising office was pretty important to helping you not only to get into courses related to the undergraduate pre-med requirements, but also to helping prepare you for medical school applications and thinking about whether you would want to take a year after college to do those or try to go straight through these are very different options at the schools. And what he was hearing from the students is that the Pitt pre-med office was really a game changer. And at Hopkins at that particular time, they were very overworked. A huge percentage of students came in pre-med, but fewer of them got through the pre-med requirements at Hopkins, he found out, than at Pitt. In area exploitation, where he matched up his assumptions against his evidence, and he did some of these creative exercises that I mentioned that I got from different places. He did a competing alternative hypothesis exercise, which basically just says, if you have different hypotheses, do your main pieces of evidence support them, or does it tend to thwart them, or does it seem to have no diagnosticity? And there what he realized was that he'd actually been researching the wrong question. It wasn't really which college to go to. If he was going to realize his dream, it was which college was going to better help him get through the rigorous pre-med requirements so that he could go on to medical school. And that drove him back into earlier parts of the process to focus even more on the pre-med office. And then in the final phase, in analysis, where you begin to bring all your pieces of information together and come to conviction on your decision, he used a final exercise there called the pre-mortem. Now, the pre-mortem is the opposite of the post-mortem, where the joke is everybody benefits but the patient (laughs) because the doctors have done the autopsy. That's depressing but true. (laughs) In the pre-mortem, you think about, okay, I think I know which decision I'm going to come to, but let me pretend that it's failed. Let me then chronicle the story of that failure, and then let me see if I can set up some constructs to prevent it from failing in that way. So at that time, when he had gone back and looked at the importance of this pre-med office, he thought he might go to Pitt, and he thought about how might that still fail, and he realized that if this pre-med office was so important, he needed to reach out, let them know he was going to be coming, ask them in advance how to best correspond and keep up with them, and then eventually he decided unexpectedly to go to Pitt. Wow. And you know what's funny about that is is when I was reading about this, I was because, you know, they they're very different schools. First of all, Pitt's in the Big East. That's right. And I am as a Georgetown basketball fan, I have to hate them. But, you know, it's still a very good school, but Hopkins obviously you think was kind of the natural choice, especially if you remove financial considerations. And so it's a very interesting thing that he was, I mean, really the FOMO driven decision would be to go to Hopkins. That's right. Um, but he was over, able to use your method to overcome his FOMO, which is, I hope he's enjoying his time. He's yes. probably working super hard. Um, but that that's kind of amazing because you're stripping out the emotion. And I'm wondering, that example kind of brings up a question for me, which is, is it Do you think the method um, is different or easier or harder to use when it's a personal decision versus a business decision? Like, you know, I'm going to buy this company vis-a-vis I'm going to decide whether or not to marry this person. Like, how do you kind of think about that? So first of all, on the marriage question, because I do tend to get this from time to time, some things you shouldn't use a decision-making system for because some things and some of the most worthwhile things in life are leaps of faith. Yeah. And I think, you know, 
um, from my vantage point, so it's just one person's opinion, I think marriage is absolutely a leap of faith. You're not doing it for purely logical or rational reasons. Otherwise, why would you? Right. Right? So I think... um, You know, the Micah example was a personal example. Um, So I think clearly it works when you have something that has emotion attached to it. And I think, you know, this idea of social proof that Hopkins has a very big reputation for good reason, um, you know, is something that's hard to overcome. And it doesn't strip out emotion. And I don't think we want to because we're human beings. And I think to be human what that means to show up as a human is to is to have feelings. What it does do is it allows us, though, to look at our assumptions and see whether or not there's evidence to underpin them. And that gives us a chance, again, to gain a little distance on our emotions and to really say, I can understand why I'd be anchored on the idea of Hopkins, but what is my goal personally? And how does that fit then with the emotional a uh, quotient that comes from being accepted to such a prestigious school. Yeah, and so it's it just reminds it takes me back to my high school days because I don't know how it was for you, but I um, you're from New England as well, so you right. know we have that. I applied to all these schools and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And you know my parents, um, my my dad hadn't gone to college, my mom did college, but as an adult later on night school. So you know we didn't they hadn't gone through this process themselves. And I went and visited all these schools and I. The one I liked the most was Georgetown. I applied there. I got in early. And I should have been happy and done. And they gave me money and everything was great. But the minute I got in, I started having FOMO and saying, like, maybe I should apply to these other schools, to Columbia and these other places I'd not even visited. My mom actually said to me, she was like, you wanted what, you know, this is what you wanted. You got in (laughs) and just go already. And so... I, you know, it's, I wish I had had the area method back when I was in high school. I can use it for other things now. Um, and what I'd love to see is I thought about as I read this book, um, thinking about politics because oh, politics, politics, politics. It's one thing that's interesting about, um, about policy making is that there's facts and there's information, and there's science that backs um, policy making or should back policy making, but then there's ideology. And, you know, I'm curious as do you think about, you know, as our lawmakers look at solving the big problems of our day, like if you could potentially apply this and how would you do that without having it sort of ruined by the injection of ideology into the process? Well, I think to use the area method, first you're building on a collaborative backbone, Mm -hmm. right? The idea has been historically that decision-making is siloed, that we're on our own. And area says if you really want to solve your problem holistically, you need to think about the incentives and motives of the other stakeholders involved in your decisions. Because if you really want to get to an outcome that has a good chance of succeeding, you're much better to be including everybody and bringing them along. So I would love to think that policymakers would be interested in a system like that because it it really gives people a safe way to gather around a table with information. And area also creates an audit trail so that you can see what your thinking was at the different parts of your decision-making process. And again, having something that's written and committing some of your research to being put down on paper gives you something that is one step removed from being personal. Mm. And it gives you something to gather around and to be able to talk about in a less personal way. I've found that for CEOs who have tried it, even on things as complicated as changing an executive compensation plan to be more incentive-based, which is something that really could hit a lot of people's hot button. If you're an executive team and you've already been compensated a certain way and then the CEO wants to set up an incentive compensation plan, and for this one CEO who used it, because he had used area, he had an entire document to show how he had looked at things from the vantage point of the different stakeholders, the sales force, that was on the front line, the executive team that's back at the home office, and what would make sense and where would they be thinking about each of the ways that they might be willing to even enter into a conversation about having pay tied to performance.
performance. And so by the time that the executive team sat down, they realized that this executive, the chief executive, had really tried to think about where they were coming from and what would matter to them so that they could then have a conversation about something that was so emotional in a way that is more rational and guided really by empathy, which is what perspective taking can give you. Empathy is what we need in our political system. And hopefully some of the students you're teaching over at Columbia will go into public service and introduce this thinking. Or maybe you could run for president and we can just <laughs> make everything. I'm I, mean, not gonna run I don't feel like that would necessarily be the most fun thing to do in the world. But, you know, um, we'll see. Uh, OK, so I, I want to uh, tell people how they can find you and maybe tell us about the new work. I know you have something yes. cooking. Tell us about what you're working so on now. So first you can find me on my website, which is areamethod.com, A-R-E-A method.com. And I have something fun if you visit the website. Not only do I have some sample cheetah sheets that you can download, but I also have a web-based app that I developed that will teach you a little bit about yourself wow. as a decision maker. And so you go through a quiz and then you end up self-categorizing into one of five different what I call problem solver profiles. And then it tells you the strengths of self-identifying that way and some of the potential pitfalls, which are a few of the key cognitive biases associated with self-identifying that way. And then just a little bit about three historical figures who also fit that archetype. And then you can also read the other templates, the other problem solver profiles, so that when you're interacting with your family or your coworkers, you have a better way to think about your intentionality for sure. your decision making. Self-knowledge is power. Absolutely. And then I have a new book that will come out in 20. 2019 called Investing in Financial Research, a Decision-Making System for Better Results. It also uses the area method, but it focuses specifically on financial decisions. So if you're considering investment analysis or you want to buy a condominium or you want to evaluate a publicly traded company, what does that actually look like if you apply a decision-making system like area? And it follows the work of some of the students in my class at the business school. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's a great segue to our faux moment of the week, which is about the fact that NPR Marketplace has reported that in China, FOMO is a $7 billion industry, um, which makes me feel like I should get in on that somehow. But why is it a $7 billion industry? Because people are spending $7 billion paying for podcasts, courses online or in person to learn how to make money quickly, flip property, buy Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and things like that. So it's become a huge big thing. And if you've ever heard me talk about Bitcoin or other speculative investments, you'll know that FOMO is definitely not an investment strategy. So um, to anybody who's listening in China, please go tell your friends that FOMO is not an investment strategy. Um, if you want to learn more about FOMO, about me, about 10% entrepreneurship, um, or about this podcast, you can visit my website at patrickmcginnis.com. Uh, you can also reach out to me and tell me your favorite FOMO moment of the week at Let's Connect at Patrick McGinnis. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. And until next time, I'll see you again on FOMO Sapiens. 